The original Xbox is an incredibly fun game system, but underneath its hard exterior shell lie a series of time bombs just waiting to go off. In just a few minutes, you'll know everything you need to know to take care of these problems and keep your Xbox running cool as a cucumber and tuned up and ready to go for the years to come. There are four things to consider depending upon the model of the Xbox that you have and the tools you have available to you. For every revision of the Xbox except version 1.6, you'll need to pull what's called the clock capacitor. All revisions of the Xbox are pretty much guaranteed to have dried up thermal paste underneath both the GPU and CPU heatsinks. That 20 year old system fan inside your Xbox is tired. A new larger system fan inside the console will help keep those system temperatures down. And finally, the port where you plug in the power cord on the back of the Xbox can get strained over time, causing the power supply to burn up. The best way to figure out which version of the Xbox motherboard you have is simply to let it tell you. If you follow my Xbox soft mining guide, you'll already have the Xbox soft mining tool installed on your system. I've got that video linked for you in the video description if you need it. If you take a look at the information pane on the right side of the tool, it will tell you exactly which version of the Xbox motherboard you're working with. In this case, this is a version 1.2 motherboard, so we'll need to remove the clock capacitor. The process for opening the Xbox across all system models is exactly the same. Before you access the six screws at the bottom of the console, I think it makes sense to fold up a protective cloth and put it in place between your work surface and the top of the Xbox. This will protect that green jewel on the top lid from getting scratched up during disassembly and reassembly. All of the tools and parts you see in this video are linked for you in the video description. The disassembly process for the Xbox starts with using a T20 Torx bit to remove six long bolts from the underside of the Xbox. Four of them are going to be underneath the rubber feet and you can access these by lifting the rubber feet from the edges toward the center of the console, but leaving the rubber feet in place so that you can stick them back down once the bolts have been removed and reinserted. The other two screws reside underneath stickers on the bottom side of the Xbox near the edges at the center. You have two options here. You can either heat and lift the stickers if you don't want to push through them and create a hole in the sticker itself, or you can just punch directly through the stickers to access the bolts underneath them. In this case, I just went ahead and pushed right through the stickers because I don't have a problem with the holes at the bottom because they also help indicate that the console has been opened in the past to any potential future owner. With the six bolts removed from the bottom, flip the Xbox back over. You'll now be able to remove the top lid. You may have to work at it along the edges just a little bit, but the top lid should come off without a great deal of resistance. Then you can set it off to the side for safekeeping until you're ready for it during the assembly process. The first thing to remove from the system is the DVD drive. There are three T10 Torx screws holding it in place. The first two are located along the corners of the DVD drive facing the front side of the console. There's also a third screw located underneath the gray ribbon cable that runs along the back side of the system. All you have to do is push the ribbon cable out of the way to access this screw. There are two sets of wires running to the back of the DVD player. These yellow ones are power wires that come in from the motherboard side. There's also the gray ribbon cable, which is a data cable. To disconnect them both, simply pull them gently from the back of the DVD player. To remove the DVD drive from the Xbox, you'll need to kind of reach underneath it and free these two retainer legs on that black frame piece. Then you can take the DVD drive out of the Xbox and set it off to the side for future reinstallation. To remove the hard drive and its caddy from the system, first, unplug the other end of the 40-pin ribbon from the motherboard. Just lift straight up from the motherboard to remove the 40-pin cable. With the ribbon cable removed, all you have to do is take the hard drive and its caddy and just flip it over to the side and away from the Xbox. The clock capacitor is located on the motherboard near the number one controller port on the front side of the Xbox. If you have version 1.0 or 1.1 of the Xbox motherboard, this is the clock capacitor you'll need to remove. For versions 1.2 through 1.4 of the Xbox motherboard, this is the clock capacitor. And if you have version 1.6 of the Xbox motherboard, don't remove the clock capacitor. They're made of high quality components as is, and if you remove it, you're likely to create functionality problems with your system. So how do you pull a bad tooth? Well, first you wiggle it until it pops out. Then you apply some alcohol to the affected area to ease the pain. No, no, not that kind of alcohol, isopropyl alcohol. Apply some to some cotton swabs and be sure to clean the area where you remove the clock capacitor. Depending upon the severity of the clock capacitor's damage, it might be pretty clean like this one, or it might have leaked electrolytic goo all over the place and ate away at some traces, which will require professional repair of your Xbox motherboard. Next up, let's tackle the thermal paste that's dried up underneath the heat sinks for the CPU and the GPU. We'll start with the CPU. 
To remove the latch arm for the CPU heatsink, first start by lifting the arm straight up. I found that it works best and it's safest to pry the arm away from the heatsink from the backside. There are no components directly underneath here, so if you use something like a flat edge screwdriver to try to pry it away, you won't risk damaging the motherboard from this area. Now you can simply lift the latch straight up and away from the CPU heatsink. Removing the heatsink from the chip can be super easy, as in this case where I was able to just lift straight up and away with the CPU heatsink, or it might be unreasonably difficult as you'll see in just a moment. With the GPU heatsink latch, I think it's easier to come at it from the front side rather than the back side. There are some components in the area, but there's some open space to get to the latch. Just pry it forward and then lift straight up to remove the latch. In the case of the GPU heatsink, the thermal paste was so dry and hardened, I wasn't able to remove it by hand. So rather than struggle with it, I went and borrowed my wife's hair dryer and applied some heat to the GPU heatsink. This actually gets in between the GPU and the GPU heatsink to that thermal paste to soften it up a bit. And you know this is my wife's hair dryer because if you've ever seen me in person, well, you know I don't need a hair dryer. You may have to go with this a time or two in order to get the heatsink freed up from the thermal paste. Just keep applying heat for a few seconds, then gently wiggling the heatsink until it's removed. And now you can see why it was stuck on there so firmly. That is some seriously dried up thermal paste. This stuff is supposed to be a wet paste and it's completely dry to the touch. It's almost like the toothpaste that forms around the outside of the toothpaste gap when it gets exposed to the air too long. This will not do. In fact, it's so dried up, this is the first time I can ever remember trying to clean up thermal paste with a microfiber cloth and isopropyl alcohol and it made absolutely no dent in the thermal paste at all. We're going to have to pull out the heavy guns here. This Arctic Clean Thermal Paste Remover should help do the trick. Place a few drops on the thermal paste, wait 30 to 60 seconds, and start wiping it away. You can apply this stuff as liberally as you need to. I've put a few drops in place here and just let it soak into the thermal paste. So how many times did this process take? Well, not just one. Not even a second application was enough. Nope, a third application was not enough to clean it completely off. Not even a fourth attempt took care of all of the thermal paste. It took a total of five times applying the thermal paste remover and wiping it with a clean microfiber cloth to get all of the old thermal paste cleaned away. But overall, I feel like the thermal paste remover did a great job of breaking up the old thermal paste. A quick note here, if you're having any difficulty wiping away any of the hardened thermal paste around the GPU or CPU, just use a toothpick to scrape it away. They're soft and they won't damage any of the components inside these areas. It was the same situation with the thermal paste on the CPU. It was hardened also and had to be chemically treated to be softened for removal. Fortunately, with just the chemical removal and a little bit of elbow grease, I was able to get the CPU cleaned up without any great deal of difficulty. Teamed up with the Arctic Thermal Paste Removal is this purifier. It helps make the surface that you're going to apply the thermal paste to squeaky clean so that the thermal paste can do an effective job of transferring heat from the chip to the heatsink. Apply a few drops to both the GPU and the CPU to clean the surfaces. This is another one of those things that you can use liberally. You're not going to hurt anything by applying a purifier and wiping it away. Follow up the application of the purifier with a clean microfiber cloth and just wipe away the purifier. This will make these surfaces squeaky clean and ready for your thermal paste. Next up, tackle those heat sinks. Starting with the CPU heat sink, I'm applying some of the thermal paste remover just like I did with the CPU and just wiping it away with a clean microfiber cloth. Hey, squeaky clean. The same goes for the GPU heat sink. Apply the thermal paste remover, then wipe it away with the microfiber cloth until the area is clean. Just like you did with the chips themselves, apply a little bit of the purifier to the CPU heat sink, then wipe it away with a clean microfiber cloth. And of course, do the same thing for the GPU heatsink. Apply a bit of the purifier and wipe it away with a clean microfiber cloth. For new thermal paste, I'm using Arctic Silver 5. There are a variety of opinions about how thermal paste should be applied, some of which are very polarizing. You can dab it in the middle, make an X across the chip, or just spread it on by hand directly out of the applicator. I would just say this, if you use too little of it, it's not going to work effectively. And if you use too much of it, well, it'll probably look like you're trying to frost a cupcake. I've only applied a dab of it here and just used the applicator to kind of spread it out across the chip before reapplying the heatsink. Same goes for the CPU chip. I've just applied a little dab and just used the tip of the applicator to just kind of spread that small dab around on the top surface of the chip. 
With the thermal paste in place, you can reattach the CPU and GPU heat sinks. In this case, I'm going to start with the GPU heat sink by just lowering it down onto the GPU die. To reattach the clamp for the GPU heat sink, orient it so that the thumb press lever faces the back of the console. Take the front side of the clamp and place it down and curl it into the base of the GPU die. Then you can take the clamp, align it across the groove through the middle of the GPU heatsink, and then press down on the thumb lever until you get it secured in place. With the CPU heatsink, the clamp faces in the opposite direction with the thumb lever facing toward the front of the console. Place the CPU heatsink on top of the CPU die. Put the clamp in place with the thumb lever facing forward, then just like you did with the GPU heatsink, rotate the other end of the clamp into the base of the CPU die. Once it's in place, lay the clamp down into the groove that runs along the CPU heatsink. Bring the other end of the clamp down to the front of the CPU die, and once both ends are in place, you can press the thumb lever down to secure the entire CPU heatsink assembly into place. Now that the thermal paste is squared away, let's upgrade this tired old system fan. Start by unplugging the system fan from the motherboard. Okay, so if you've got a Gorilla Grip, you can probably just take these retaining arms and just push them out of the way by hand. Otherwise, you might consider using something like a flathead screwdriver to just loosen their grip on the fan. With the arms loosened from the fan, you should be able to wiggle the fan out, straight up, and out of the console. Now's a good time to blow out all of the dust and debris that's been stored in your Xbox system for 20 years. I'm using one of those awesome plug-in endless cans of compressed air because they save you money and they're good for the environment. Remember, all this stuff featured in the video is linked in the description for you. The 70mm Nexus fan is not only brand new, it's also larger than the original fan, so it's going to push more air out of the system, keeping things cooler internally. The air flows out of this fan in the direction of the sticker on it. By the way, if you forget this, you can also look right on the top of the housing and there's an arrow indicating the direction of the airflow. To insert the new Nexus fan into the Xbox case, make sure the label faces the back side of the system and press it directly down into the two retaining arms. You'll find that even though the fan is larger than the original, it still doesn't fit well inside those retaining arms. You can address this either by purchasing or 3D printing a custom shroud for the fan, or you can simply secure the fan in place to the case using a set of zip ties. In this example, I'm just using a pair of black zip ties to run them through the mounting holes at the top of the fan into a pair of vertical slots in the grill on the back of the case. These are the exact same two vertical slots that the 3D mount bracket would have pushed into. Once the zip ties are secured down, you can cut away the excess using a pair of scissors or flush cutters. The plug lead on the new fan is different than the original one. Just make sure the black wire on the Nexus plug faces the front of the Xbox game system. Then with the black wire facing forward, press the power plug down onto the motherboard. As my dad would have said, it can be a little fickle. Just take your time to line things up correctly, and it will push down in place just like it was the OEM plug. The wires off this new fan are almost unreasonably long. To deal with this inside your system, just take an additional zip tie and secure the wires together with the zip tie so that you can lay them down in place inside the Xbox. Your power supply can develop some nasty cold solder joints at the port where you plug in the power wire. You'll need to remove the power supply in order to fix this. Start by removing the two T10 Torx screws that hold in the power supply, one here, and a second one that's tucked away underneath these colored wires at the edge of the power supply. There are two sets of wires running from the power supply to the motherboard. To disconnect the large set, push the tab in on the back side of the wires and just pull straight up from the motherboard out of the socket. To remove the yellow wires, pull up gently to remove them out of the motherboard socket. To remove the power supply from the Xbox, lift up on the front side of the power supply near the controller ports. Then pull the power supply slightly forward to free it from the back of the Xbox shell. Flip over the power supply and take a look at where the power port is soldered to the circuit board. There are four solder joints here. The first two solder joints take power from the power supply and feed it directly to the power port. The outside two solder joints are reinforcement points for the power port onto the circuit board. Over time, as you push the power cord into the power port, it can weaken these solder joints. This can lead to damage to the power supply and ultimately the Xbox motherboard. To prevent this from happening, it's a good idea to reflow the solder at each of these solder joints and add some fresh solder into them as you go along through the process. This will help reinforce each of those solder joints and help make sure your power port is protected against physical damage for the years to come. 
With the power supply out, it's a good opportunity to give the system one more dusting before you reassemble everything. Reinstalling the power supply is the exact opposite of taking it out. Start by pushing the power port through the access hole at the back of the Xbox system. Once the power port's in place, you can lay the Xbox power supply flat down into the system. Replace the two screws that hold the power supply down to the motherboard. Don't forget that that one screw lives underneath the colored wiring near the front of the system. You previously disconnected two sets of wires from the motherboard. To put these back in place, they're keyed so they can only go in one direction. I actually think it's easier to start by connecting the smaller set of wires first and the larger set of wires second. That way, the large wires that come off the large plug don't get in the way of your access to plugging in the small set of wires with the small plug to the motherboard. To reassemble the Xbox, place the Xbox hard drive and its caddy back into place. As they say here in the southern United States, oh, you might have to fiddle with it just a little bit. It doesn't just actually lay down in the console, it has some specific places that it needs to fit to in order to sit flush inside the Xbox console. You'll need to connect the 40 wire data cable back to the motherboard. To do this, it's key, just push it back down into the motherboard socket with the key facing in the right direction. You'll need to restore the connections for power and for data to the back of the DVD drive. Plug in the yellow cable in exactly the way in which it was removed. It's keyed, but it also is kind of like already formed in the right direction that it needs to face for you to plug it into the back of the Xbox DVD drive. Pretty cool, huh? The same goes for the gray 40 wire IDE cable. It's keyed and it can only go in one way into the IDE port on the back of the DVD drive. Push it into the back of the drive to secure it in place. If inserting the hard drive and its caddy into the system's a little bit fickle, inserting the DVD drive in its caddy can be outright fussy. You'll know you've got it right when you have the bottom feet of the DVD caddy sitting in place at the bottom of the system and the front door and the front door cover sitting flush in the bottom system tray. Three screws came out, three screws go back in. One at each corner of the DVD drive and the third screw that lives underneath the gray 40 wire IDE ribbon cable. With the DVD screws in place, you can secure the ribbon cable by just pushing it into this locking tab shown here. To replace the lid back onto the Xbox system, just push it straight down from the top. You may have to make some minor adjustments along the back and sides in order to get things to line up correctly. It can be a little fussy again, but just stay with it, check your alignment on all four sides, and it should snap right back down into place securely. Six screws came out of the bottom, six screws go back in. Four of them go underneath the rubber feet and two into the labels where you previously removed them. Remember these are T20 Torx bits just in case you need to swap the bit out on your driver. The work's done it all, but how can you tell if it even made a difference? Well, there's only one way to find out. Let's power this puppy on and see what happens. So these were the original temperature readings I took for the CPU and GPU before I did any of this upgrade work. These aren't terrible, but we're about to do better. And I mean a lot better. Take a look at these updated readings from after all of this upgrade work was done. These have changed dramatically. They've transformed to 9 to 12 degrees lower, making things much cooler inside the Xbox. If you still need to soft mod your Xbox, this video shown on screen and linked in the description and pinned comment will show you the way. I look forward to seeing you over there.